I speak to you this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There is no more familiar a passage in all of Scripture than John 3.16. It's on billboards and bumper stickers. It's sewn into throw pillows and baseball caps. It's even appeared tattooed on the skin of more than a few actors and athletes. And yet, as familiar as the 16th verse of John's third chapter is, it's juxtaposed against the verses immediately following it. Ben, am I still on? Yeah? Okay, just wanted to make sure. As familiar as the 16th verse of John's third chapter is, it's juxtaposed against the verses immediately preceding it, which are undoubtedly some of the most unfamiliar verses in the New Testament. In those verses, Jesus talks about Moses lifting up a snake in the wilderness, which is one of the most bizarre stories in the Torah. The story Jesus is referring to is found in the book of Numbers, which we just heard Penny recite today. And if we... Here we encounter the Hebrew people, having been liberated from the Egyptians, but still wandering around in the wilderness in search for the land which has been promised to them. And the longer they wander, the crankier they become. And they take aim at God and Moses alike, crying out with impatience and frustration. The book of Numbers depicts five so-called murmuring episodes in which the Hebrew people grumble and complain about an assortment of perceived grievances. They don't like the food. They want more water. They're tired. They want to go back to Egypt. They're sick of camping. Just picture a minivan loaded up for a road trip with a gaggle of unhappy toddlers kicking the seats, throwing popcorn and screaming, are we there yet? And that's probably just what it was like. Each episode follows a predictable pattern. The Hebrew people complain. God gets angry. The Hebrew, Hebrew people realize that they've made God angry and they beg Moses to intercede on their behalf. Moses does and God calms down. And then a few chapters later, another tantrum erupts and the same pattern unfolds. Wash, rinse, repeat. Finally, their sniping reaches a boiling point. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? They grumbled against God and Moses, for there is no food and there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Now, if you listen carefully, you'll catch the level of absurdity beneath their whining. They say there is no food and water. They moan in one breath, and then we detest this miserable food in the next breath. In response, God punishes them for their rebelling by sending venomous snakes into their encampment. And at this point in the story, some of us may be thinking, well, that's a little bit harsh, God. Those snakes bit people and some even died. But I think we must read this scripture with a bit of theological imagination. The Hebrew people were faced with a choice. On the one hand was a life-giving relationship with God that challenged everything they thought they knew about the way the world worked and pushed them to greater depths of faith and obedience. On the other hand was the monotony of slavery in Egypt, which would surely lead to death. But at least it offered some semblance of consistency and predictability along the way. Over and over again, the Hebrew people voiced their desire to go back to Egypt and pick up where they left off as slaves to Pharaoh. And in one scene, they actually hatch a plan. Let us choose a captain and go back to Egypt, they say in verse 4. At least in Egypt, they knew how the system worked. With God, there was no telling where they would be led to or what they would be asked to do. 
So enough with this chosen people stuff. We'll take our mundane life of slavery back. Thank you very much. And yet, the narrative arc of the Old Testament in particular and scripture in general is one of a relentless and undeterred God doing whatever it takes to maintain his relationship with humankind. Even here, as the Hebrew people are hell-bent on marching back to a certain death in Egypt because they feared what they did not know and couldn't predict, God continues to be for them the source of all life. As the Hebrews repent from their foolish and seditious ways, God hears their prayer and once again sets before them this wellspring of life and healing. But the way God chooses to do it is what makes this passage even stranger. God tells Moses to craft a venomous snake and put it onto a pole so that those who were bitten could look at it and be healed. Moses did as he was told, and he crafted a venomous snake from bronze, put it on a pole, and set it out in the midst of the people. And whenever a snake bit someone, they looked at the bronze snake and they lived. In fact, the statue worked so well that it became a kind of cultural icon among the Hebrew people. The statue was passed from one generation to the next until centuries later, it winds up in the temple in Jerusalem. And by then, it had garnered an almost cult-like following, which prompts King Hezekiah to have it destroyed. Although we know that this unfamiliar and bizarre tale probably won't make it into our vacation Bible school curriculum anytime soon, at its heart is a universal truth. There is no venom quite so deadly as fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the other. Fear of failure. Fear of death. Nothing causes spiritual and emotional paralysis more effectively than fear. It corrodes faith. It cuts off our pathways for giving and receiving grace and mercy. And if it is left untreated for long enough, it gives way to hatred. Hardness of heart and soul. And leads ultimately to death. As we continue on our Lenten journey, there may be no more important a time for us to take account of the ways in which each of us are afflicted by the venom of fear. It's only when the Hebrew people brought that which they feared most into full view that they were made whole again. I think the same is true for us. As we begin to come into full view of the cross and the reality of death on Good Friday, it is only by walking headlong into death's dark shadow that we come to know the fullness of Christ's resurrected life. So rejoice indeed. God so loves the world. Amen.